Hello. Can anyone hear me? Yeah. Hi. Good morning. Okay. Great. Morning. Right. Just wanted to make sure my audio wasn't messed up. <laughs> okay. Let me put the link in. Hi, I've dialed in um, due once again to Zoom problems, so. Oh, good. Uh, I don't see Matthew on yet, so I'm gonna make a new um, meeting thing on the, the dock. Give me one second. All right, I have created the um, the notes for today's meeting. I'm gonna put the link in the chat. I guess Matthew isn't here today, so I'll facilitate. Okay, so we, um, if anyone can, would like to scribe and can scribe, it would be good if we can get at least one. Okay, so, um, Today's gonna be a working session and um, next week is gonna be a presentation. We're having the folks from um, Parsec um, do a presentation. They are submitting their project for Sandbox and the project revolves uh, around um, kind of a, an abstraction layer for hardware, security devices, HSM, CPM, stuff like that. So that will be next week. So next week's gonna be a presentation um, so today, it seems like there's only one thing on the agenda. So we're going to do um, check-ins and then if you have um, any other things that you want to discuss, please put them in um, the meeting notes. All right. Um, so... No updates. Seems like we have no updates today. Okay, great. Um, if there's anyone that um, can help scribe, that would be great.
All right, I think we're still looking for a scribe. If um, there's anyone can take a volunteer, that would be really helpful. I'll give it a try, but my audio quality is not great. Okay. All right, thanks so much again, Ash, <laughs> as usual. And uh, Justin, thanks. Okay, so it looks like there's no updates. Um, so we're gonna skip check-ins here. Um, checking in from other six, policy, work group, uh, NIST, work groups, so on. Um, Mark, anything from your side? Nope, um, yeah, put out the call again for anybody interested in uh, analytics as a service and standards around that to support cybersecurity. Uh, we meet every other week on Tuesdays, so ping me if you're interested. Sort of standing offer until we get this thing launched later. Gotcha. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, at some point that uh, there'd be something that you guys could present to the group. Um, yeah, this is a professor at Indiana University and when they went virtual, he had to go underground playing catch up, so. <laughs> Justin, I don't know if that happened to you, but he got too busy at that point, so that's on hold. Okay. All right, whenever that's ready again. Uh, just, yeah, thanks just, for remembering, though. Yeah. All good. All right. So the only issue that we have today, I'm gonna, this is something that I, I, I brought up. Hi, Brennan. Yeah. One quick uh, update that we did have our policy work group meeting uh, this morning at eight. That's an every other week meeting. And uh, we posted the uh, notes from the, the quick call, if anyone's interested. And uh, we're just talking about a policy violation CRD for Kubernetes. Cool. Uh, by the way, is there any chance that, uh, I know we haven't done an update um, with the, the policy group in a while as well. Um, is, is there like a, do you think you could, is there like a way you could do like a couple, maybe 10, 15 minutes kind of um, just talk a little bit about, at, at one of the next working sessions to just talk a bit about what's new over there and then at least keep up to date on that. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, when uh, we're going to post an update probably in two weeks to the CRD proposal. And so I think that would be a good time to present to this group when we have that proposal ready. Okay, great. Thank you. Can you also um, add a link to anything from your meeting or you mentioned some reference material or something like that? Um, there's a, I left a spot in my scribe notes for a link uh, in case people are want to go and follow up. And I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name either. I, I'm called in so I can't see who's talking. Can you say your name? Oh, this is Robert Ficalia. Oh, okay, okay, great. Yeah, um, if you can just add a, add a link below for people that want to look at it, that might be helpful. Absolutely, we'll do that. All right, thanks, Robert. Okay. So um, one of the issues that um, I started working on again is the security landscape iteration two. Um, this is something that uh, Jess and I started working on. And so we, we made a lot of progress on that. And for those that um, were not around the first time we talked about this, uh, the main uh, kind of motivation for this was that we found that the original landscape wasn't really that useful in terms of consumption. Uh, it was just kind of like a list of categories and a list of projects. And they re didn't really give a lot of um, information on how to use it. Um, so, and if, if, if you want to take a look at the, this is the current landscape, right? It's, um, we've created categories and we said, okay, here are some of the different technologies within the categories and so on. Um, but a lot of the time, like some of these things, we like we had a, a huge um, discussion on this, which is identity access control isn't really um, a specific technology on its own, it's integrated into multiple technologies. You know, how does it 
is it a category on its own in the landscape or should it be part of um, basically a broad category that spans across every, every technology? Um, so a while back, Justin and I um, started working on this. Uh, so Justin and Kapos and I put in together this um, kind of first cut on how we wanted to see the security landscape. And the thought was that we will break it down into how to use cloud native security um, based on the processes. So one of the first things that we tackled was um, application security. So how do you create and deploy a um, application in cloud native security? And the idea is of that is there will be a process. So we, we wrote down basically here, here are the steps in which um, uh, a developer would deploy application. So you write the code, uh, you commit it to GitHub and so on. Um, and the idea is that at every step of the way, you would run into several threats and we want to map these threats onto the possible preventions or mitigations. And that way, um, a developer can come in, take a look at um, how their process maps onto uh, the landscape that we've provided and then look at the specific technologies that they can use. Um, and on the micro level, the idea is that we will be able to provide the details of the threats on uh, the technologies, referencing the technologies and projects in CNCF that help to mit mitigate these threats. Um, and on the macro level, uh, we want to be able to uh, provide kind of a process which people can follow, um, which people can use to maybe bring to their, their managers or, or, or executives to say that, okay, here is kind of like a model that we can follow. Um, so the details is just one aspect of it. Uh, one thing that we, we talked about quite a bit was um, being able to have kind of like a bird's eye view on this. And so we created the mock-up and the idea here is if this loads, okay, let me try this later. Um, the idea here is that we wanna be able to create kind of like a, an overview of here are the various kind of processes that um, we have in regards to cloud native. And then here are um, if you're interested in, in this case, building a cloud native app securely, we can look at this process. And the idea is that um, this will be kind of an exploratory interface. Uh, and then if you click on one of these, um, uh, pro, um, these nodes over here, it's gonna give you kind of like a, a more in-depth view of, of here are the threats, here's how you mitigate them. Um, so this is where we are at currently in the process. We've done the mock-up and I think the next step here is um, to kind of create an example for this and create a, some kind of interactive um, web page so that we can try this out. And then on top of that, to start building the content on, um, for different types of processes. So, the next step I think for us here is to um, actually create a, a website or a mockup. Have some HTML to do this. Um, I'm gonna try and take a step at this myself, but I am not a <laughs> uh, a web person. So if there's anyone that um, would like to work on this as well, um, do leave a comment here. Um, any expertise in this or whether you're just interested in creating more content and giving feedback on this, that would, anything would be great. Okay, and I think the other issue that we that we can talk about here is the one on key cloak. Um, 
I guess both uh, I if we have a review team ready for this, um, when would you kind of see the the window for doing the review would be? Uh, at a time, I can get necessary people from team involved shortly. Okay. Uh, so Justin, do you, do you think that is this um, this is the next project in the pipeline for assessments, right? What is that? Yeah, I mean, uh, we have a couple of assessments that are sort of stalling, but there's no active assessment going on right now. And um, I think, uh, I mean, I would like to ask Ash to lead the assessment. Are you comfortable with that, Ash? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I'll just need some hand holding at the beginning, but yeah, I'll be happy to uh, lead this one. Okay, great. Um, so what I'll do is I'll note that on the uh, on the documentation here, mm -hmm. um, and really, then the question is for you. Do you feel like you're ready to go and start? Um, you've got three other reviewers here um, that have have uh, you know volunteered to participate. Do have any of the other reviewers done a review before or shadowed or anything like that? This would be my first time. Okay, that's that's fine. Um, if someone else has done a review and would be willing to participate, it's not too late to be added in. Um, I think everybody, from what I recall here, all of the reviewers have already gone and put their conflict statements in. Um, so that part's been done. And now um, I'm, I think we're just waiting on the chairs to sign off on reviewer conflicts for the top part to be done. Um, so we'll, you know, I'll go ahead and start this process a little bit. Like I'll make the Slack channel mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, and uh, Ash, you should probably start taking a look at the at the um, the document to do the. I guess it's technically clarifying questions phase or something. We changed the name yep. slightly, but um, to, to start that part of the process. Awesome. Um, all right, so I think that's all that we, at least um, that was in the agenda for today. Um, any just, other discussion points? Just a quick question about that. So do we need the approval from the chairs before we uh, start looking at that or can we start with the, uh, the question phase? Oh, you can, you can go ahead and start. It's just, um, we, we don't want that to be a blocking thing. It's, it's just that they need to do that sooner rather than later. And uh, I assume like a uh, Bolslaw, will you be on Slack? Is that more comfortable uh, once you create the channel? Do you, do you? Uh, yeah, I try to be, I try to monitor Slack and I'm, I'm on CNCF Slack and I'll get a uh, project lead to join as well. Okay. Uh, so either Slack or, you know, or just via email is, is fine as well, but we'll, we'll try to be, to, to monitor Slack. Yeah, perfect. Do you have access to add everyone's, um, I don't know if you have edit access to, to change the issue thing at the top. I think you probably do. Um, but if so, can you add in, so I just added you in as a project security lead. Can you add everybody else in who should be contacted? Or I guess I can just invite you to the Slack channel and then you can, um, uh, like add whomever, but okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, that's, that sounds fine. Uh, I can add people like, I think I can add Krishna and the rest of the reviewers on the Slack channel and we can, we can start a conversation there. Does that work? Yeah, I think that sounds good.
Yeah, it does. I'll, I'll ensure that uh, necessary people are get added there soon. Um, is the channel already created, or do we need some other privileges to create one? I guess you I don't guess need, you don't need privileges adding, to create. I, I I just created it, and I'm adding people now. Okay. All right. I'm struggling with the um, what is someone's real name given their GitHub name uh, <laughs> or spot name, but I'm getting there. All right. Sounds good. Okay, um, do, any other issues that people want to talk about or just like ideas that, that people have, any thoughts, um, if there's anything that um, you're working on that you would like to share, um, anything. It's Underwood here, just a short question um, for the, the surveyors that are doing some of the reviews. Do we call out Assurance tasks, for example, if somebody says we have feature X and the reviewer, you know, kicks the tires on multi-factor or something and says, okay, they did that. Uh, is there any call out for assurance tasks to automate CICD pipeline to assure that the features are still working after, you know, future revisions or, you know, deployments in new environments? Um. So, so I think the, let me see if I understand this correctly. So we, we are talking about the security assessment, right? Okay. Um, we do review the aspects of having a process. Um, and right now our benchmark is the, the CI badging system. I don't think we go into specific details like whether something uh, necessarily is said to be there, but isn't there. I think we generally take the, the we, we trust that the, the project says what it does. Um, I think if not though, it's just the scope will just be too big. Um, yeah, no, I no argument with that. I just want to offer the use case of what we've run into uh, in big enterprises, there's potentially conflicts with other tools when you deploy these things in the environment and features that worked when they were being tested in standalone stopped working. Uh, so having these secondary, you know, if you want to think of them as secondary or subsequent assurance steps available ends up helping you untangle some of these conflicts that that occur. In fact, I don't have any official statistics about it, but as many as I would say, well, I, as many as a quarter of the issues that arise in a major a security shop like ours in a Fortune 500 company might be associated with uh, what version to version conflicts or apparent conflicts between tools, which makes which interrupts the telemetry stream. So, you know, cloud native, you know, is a forward leaning organization. It's something to think about. So, if the um, if the projects come through with those kind of features, you know, will be a plus if not a necessary feature. I I would add that, um, so I never looked at the versioning conflicts that could occur or the interactions for, you know, when I looked at OPA, Falco, um, but, but Brandon, just to comment on what you said, I did trace back what was on the CII badging documentation and uh, you know, Ash can attest to this. It, I, I did actually go through and at least spot check that if they said they had a notification process, that there was some evidence that that process had actually been demonstrated in, in their change log or in their their patch releases or whatnot. Um, but that's about the level. I mean, I, I consider that fairly superficial. But that was about. There was some, at least the first layer. I tried to scratch the surface of everything presented of the CII evidence. Yeah, I understood. It, you know, test automation, it's a problem in software engineering writ large, not just in security, but sometimes we have to lead instead of follow. Is, is that a kind of like framework of particular projects that do this well, that we can have as a recommendation? Or? Yeah. That's a subject of considerable debate. <laughs> uh, I, 
you know, they, the, the DevOps community wants you to build it in the pipeline with an embedded test tool like Cucumber or something that, you know, looks at the results from the tool and says, okay, it's still working. And if it fails, it automate, you know, automates notifications to the developer, but other people think that's not sufficient for complex environments where you're running multiple tools because, you know, the, the CI CD pipeline is a necessarily pristine one with a lot of uh, segregated namespaces and uh, de test data and so on. And, and that's not the environment it gets deployed into. So I don't know that there's a consensus around doing that. Um, so I think we're consigned to sort of a checkbox kind of approach, but you know, getting often as you tell the developers, they need to do this, it kind of changes their behavior because they think, oh, gee, I got to stand up a, a dev environment now that um, provides telemetry to do automated testing feedback. And that changes the way they code in, in an ideal circumstance. So, but yeah, I don't think there's a standard around this yet that anybody has been satisfied with. That, that, that no, sounds and, like, and I can, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, just, I, one more data point, having had this conversation yesterday with a fairly large organization um, you know, they're trying to figure this out as well. Um, so at that, at that scale, scale, you know, large cloud provider level, um, discussions around how you trace CI CD execution specifically for dev and QA environments pre-production to your policy framework, your risk assessment framework, um, you know, not even scratching down to the level of version control on all of those risks. Uh, it's, it's, you know, bleeding edge. People are thinking about it, uh, but no one has a defined or even standard frame, uh, framework or tooling for that. This sounds like it could be a, an addition to the security landscape um, application creation um, development process that Justin Kapos and I are working on. Yeah, I think I could share, you know, I could do a short deck on this at some future meeting, if you like, to stand up kind of the, the approaches that we've seen and some of them that we tried. Um, again, I don't think the result is super compelling, um, but we do, we have seen, for example, embedding security people in the Agile teams to get the, it's the assurance tasks built into the, uh, the, into the sprints. Uh, that works for the teams that operate that way. But also, it depends on the kind of security feature that it is. Some of them are just are, are not men, amenable to that. Um, also, there's the sort of high profile or high um, privileged access problem of, uh, you know, what level of security, you know, in an RBAC kind of framework do you need to have to, to run the test in? And is that compatible with the one that you find yourself running in production? And if not, how does that look? Then there's the data problem of getting representative data to exercise the thing. That's similar to the one you run with dynamic testing, right? People would say, why doesn't CNCF do dynamic tests with commercial tools to kick the tires on the products? And I don't, I don't know if you do that or not, but that's hard to do too, even if you have pretty good tooling around it. So I just wanted to comment on that. Uh, this was something that I brought up when we did the Harbor review. And uh, I had suggested that, uh, you know, because a lot of the artifacts are containers and images, et cetera, you know, at least why don't we, as we, one of the, uh, I don't know, considerations, if you will, should have been like a complete uh, repo scan of all the images, et cetera. And, uh, and the response I got was, uh, we don't want to be too prescriptive from that standpoint. I'm not saying that that's right or wrong, but the, the response that was given was, we don't want to be too prescriptive. We don't want that to be a gate, as well as the fact that in the case of Harbor, we had uh, actually, they had actually done uh, security testing, pen testing two, three times from different organizations at different points in the, in the whole process. So I, and personally, I'm all for being a little bit more prescriptive to say, hey, as SIG security, you know, can we have the opportunity and should we start instilling these kinds of capabilities? And I think, Mark, to your point, I think some tools exist it's very low hanging and we have the opportunity to, to define that and 
bring it in as we perform these security assessments. But at the same time, I think Dan, I just to paraphrase, uh, and I'm probably going to butcher it, but I think we just want to perform the assessment, but uh, I, I forget the right term, the, his uh, verbiage, but uh, it's there in the documentation. But I think we don't want to be caters. I, I think that's the, the overarching position, I believe. I would uh, like to chime in here a sec. Um, I think that there's um, there's a real like danger or risk uh, if we start to go too far afield there. Um, the the concern is um, most of us don't do pen like pen testing and these like detailed security audits regularly, and the the firms and groups that do this well. It's more than obviously just running tools and reporting back and looking at real low hanging fruit. So Harbor has been through something like three different real security audits, including one by Cure 53, which is, you know, was very detailed. And so I feel like, um, you know, starting to do things that run, that have us run tools on code bases starts to make us look like a really bad audit. And I think we're better off looking like a really good assessment um, than a really bad, than a, than a good assessment and a really bad audit. Um, so if we were going to build that capacity, I think we would need to get Trail of Bits or uh, Tier 53 or some other group like that to partner with us. And then for us to do some kind of like combined assessment audit, but I, I I definitely don't feel like, um, you know, just to use an example here, like I, I kind of just tapped Ash on the shoulder and said, hey, please leave this assessment. Um, and I, I, you know, have some uh, degree of comfort from that because of the great job he did on the other side of this, on the recipient side from the OPA thing. The other reviewers on the assessment, I don't really know. I don't know that I've interacted with in any great detail before. And so, uh, for, for us, like, you know, for me to just say, oh, yeah, now you guys go, like, do what's basically, you know, a lightweight audit is, I think, um, scary. It, it's already mildly scary to do the assessment part like this, but, you know, there's some degree of comfort with, with having worked with ASH. But you, I, I think the further we go in this, the, the harder it's going to be to get qualified people and, and the worse our work product will be. Actually, I, I agree. I think the, the key words from uh, what you mentioned to me for me was an audit versus an assessment. An audit is far more, uh, uh, you know, de uh, greater in depth and provides obviously far more introspection as opposed to an assessment. And given that these are assessments, I think what we are performing right now is, uh, is suitable. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. It does seem like this version testing stuff is also um, kind of questionable whether it's on the borderline of the project responsibility or whatever you're integrating with because uh, usually the projects can be used in more than one way and I don't know whether it's really on the onus of the, the, the project itself to maintain all integra uh, integration compatibility. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, I look at the assessments as prospective, whereas audits are retrospective. Um, so I would say if in the assessment process, we thought, you know, there was a consensus around that there's interactions and version control and all that was a key element of the risk model for that particular project. I'm, I'm not, I don't have a hypothetical where that may be true or false, but if for whatever reason, the consensus was that that should be done, I don't think that the assessment should, to your point, Justin, I don't think just that we should do that work with tools and a specific output. I think the assessment recommendation would be that that should be done by the project at some future time to address that risk. Yeah, these are all good points. And, you know, I, some of this I think is nudging, not auditing. Um, and I think there's a useful distinction to be made here between software engineering practices and the extent to which they become ubiquitous. And uh, in our organization, and you know, I'm 
in a fairly narrow world of dealing with DevOps adoption and standardization. And that, you know, maybe doesn't reflect the whole world very well, but the Jenkins and the Jenkins like model for code development is so ubiquitous, ubiquitous outside of security that to not have that built into part of the assessment seems like a miss. Well, well, we do have a spot assessment um, as part of like, make sure it's there uh, and kind of do uh, a certain level of like surface level checking. Um, I, I'm not sure what you would mean um, in that case, like in the self-assessment, would we have additional question about um, like the types of integration tests that you have? I, I don't know what we could ask as a broad question. And the, the, the other thing is, I mean, a, a, quite a few of the things that we have around process come from the CII stuff. And I think it would be worth talking to them if about potentially adding things, but I think that's been a, I think the CII badges has been very helpful for in terms of looking at maturity of process and projects. And I think encouraging people to go along that path, which we already have some requirements around in CNCF and things, and we've talked to projects about, I think is a good way of approaching that. Yeah, well, maybe I'm sorry I brought it up. <laughs> it's it's uh, a little corny. You know, there's the easy example to use is if you, you know, like take encryption, you know, uh, because we're, I'm dealing in PI, PCI settings, you know, we want to make sure that the encryption still works at the other end. So, you know, you can check it at a point in time, you can, but you can also have it checked to see whether the encryption occurred using an automated task. That's got a lot of value uh, beyond the claim that there's encryption happening in the product, you know, a, a cer in a certain path where there's data in motion or uh, uh, even for data at rest as well. So um, it probably depends on the use case and for a product that's, that's you know, uh, as mature as um, Harbor was, you know, and has already been through a lot of testing, it seems kind of silly. But on the other hand, if you look at a, a mature product like Prometheus, which is embedded in a lot of other products, and there's a lot of dependency on the robustness of certain features of that tool, you know, I would feel safer if I had a pipeline that was doing builds that was doing assurance testing on uh, security features of uh, Prometheus at the same time. This sounds like a, a good kind of I think the suggestions are good and it seems like for specific cases like you talked about, like for crypto, there are certifications that can be done, right? And I think that's generally how these are enforced is that there's a specification and then you can get certified by somebody. Um, I think this would be good scope for kind of like if we were to do like a white paper or as part of the recommendations. Mm. But I think um, definitely we can be kept in mind for assessments if if a reviewer thinks that, okay, this is um, a, a project which is used at a certain production level standard and we can make the recommendation um, to the CNCF that, okay, perhaps um, this project should um, CNCF should, you know, spend some money and let this project go through a certain level of certification. Um, but, but it seems, like you said, very um, case by case dependent. Yeah, well, but, and just to extend your, your hypothetical there, Brandon, I mean, and this may be germane to the Parsec discussion because in, in hardware environments, especially certification for payment and whatnot, that is exactly what happens. You have to recertify if your firmware changes or revs. Um, and so, you know, that might be a, a special case where, you know, version control is, is far more relevant to the risk model. Um, it's not, it doesn't really fit into your Jenkins software CI CD case mark, but that may be a case where the assessment says, 
you know, you really ought to be doing things every version rev uh, to retest or re recertify or whatnot. But I, again, I would say that the assessment should make that recommendation based on a particular risk, not necessarily perform that, that certification. Right, understood. Well, yeah, I think I, a thought too, I agree, that's not a bad idea. Yeah, I, I see the value in this. I think maybe we can uh, can kind of like add it as a as a question in the self assessment to be like, okay, um, is the project at large scale enough that it requires certain level of certification? Um, yeah, it's also the ecosystem's evolving with a lot of dependencies, and you know that's for those of us that are adopting some of these tools directly or index directly through our tools. It's a cause for some uh, what insecurities or anxieties. Mm -hmm. you, want, you mean you want to sleep well at night? <laughs> yeah, there's that. <laughs> I don't know why I joined this field. It seems orthogonal to good sleep. All right, great. Thanks for bringing this up. This was a good discussion. Yeah, thanks, Brandon. All right. Uh, so before we close out, um, um, we have Justin Cormack. Do you want to give some comments, announcements? Yeah, I just yes. wanted to say that um, the public comment period for the Spiffy Spire incubation is now open. So please comment on the mailing list. There's actually accidentally two threads. Either of them will do. Um, uh, but really, thanks for everyone who out work on the assessment and, and other due diligence work and this group for Spiffy Spire is, was really helpful and thorough and um, and uh, so um, that was really, really good work and they're really helpful. Thanks, so thanks very much. So I, I noticed on a thread before, maybe I misinterpreted this, but there were a lot of people that were just sort of saying plus one to a lot of the threads without really adding any any value. And I think someone at some point was like, stop just saying plus one, right? Um, is it valuable for us to weigh in and say, yeah, you know, um, we've really done a thorough look at this and it's a really strong security project. Is that useful to say in that thread? Because I've been kind of loath to just weigh in and say that about Spiffy Spire or to comment on Harbor or things like that because of it. Um, yeah, I think it, I think, um, yeah, I think the, a comment that's got, that isn't just plus one is, that is actually substantive in, in real sentences is valuable. I have to say the public comment periods recently have been very, on the actual mailing list have been totally, uh, the one for Helm, no one said anything at all, which was kind of weird. Um, so I think that um, yeah, supportive comments that are, that are actually have substance are, are great. Or, or obviously unsupportive comments if people like actually have a have an issue that's not been addressed at this point. But um, but yeah, I think it, it's it's good to comment. So question about the public comment stuff. So I'm, you know, my organization's not a CNCF member, so I'm sort of a lurker in that respect. This is an open meeting uh, regarding those public comment periods. Is that truly public or is there Yes, that's truly public. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Roger. I mean, so from my point of view, I think that, you know, Spiffy Inspire has done everything that you could expect a sandbox project to do. And I'm really, you know, they've, got integrated in lots of different places and um, having those sort of the conversations with other projects and in the way we'd like to encourage. So I think it's um, been a very positive, you know, I think it's very positive for them to move into incubation. I agree, um, but also I just want to point out, I don't think they've actually completed their assessment, have they? The assessment process. Um, so they've completed the assessment process. Um, the only step that we don't have the check mark on is the optional um, presentation to the TOC, which um, 
I, I don't think we've gotten a request for that. And also because I think since you've done that presentation before, I don't think there has been that request coming in yet. I see. And also somehow the sign off by the chairs hasn't happened. So should I move this to completed? Or um, may, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll flag the chairs and we'll see. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, but in terms of content and everything else, uh, it's everything's there. Okay, so um, if we don't have any other topics, then we can wrap up for today and we will have the Parsec presentation next week. That's good. Be safe, everybody. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.